I would like to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Tom Slatter. Tom Slatter, PhD 2003 from King's College London, is reader in urban geography at the University of Edinburgh. His research centers on the relations between market processes and state structures in producing and reinforcing social inequalities in the city. He has written extensively on gentrification, displacement from urban space, territorial stigmatization, welfare reform, and social movements. Notably, he co-authored two books, Gentrification in 2008 and The Gentrification Reader in 2010. And he's currently working on a long-term study of the role of right-wing think tanks in manufacturing ignorance of the causes of urban poverty and inequality. A heavy and promising agenda. Please. Thank you very much. Shall I try that? Okay. Okay. Shall I talk? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mona. Thank you, Robert. Thank you to the uh, the organisers. Uh, it's a huge honour. Uh, to open the 2015 edition of this prestigious City Debates series. Um, I want to applaud uh, the exemplary organization and echo uh, how brilliant uh, Abia El Tayeb has been uh, in making sure that we all got here and uh, everything that we asked for. Uh, it, was, uh, it was all done so smoothly, so thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming along. Uh, it, it's alarming uh, in Britain how academic life uh, it just seems to get busier and busier and busier all the time. Um, so if that's the case here, uh, thank you for making time uh, to come along and to learn more about uh, gentrification and to have some debates uh, in, in the spirit uh, uh, of this series. Um, I'm also very eager to learn about this city um, and also processes of urbanization in this region. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to the contributions over the next uh, couple of days. Um, another thank you. I want to thank my good friend Katerina Thorn uh, in Gothenburg for allowing me to use this photograph uh, that she took uh, in the neighborhood where she is studying gentrification. It's, it's one of my favorites. Now, there's a, there's a massive literature on gentrification. There are many different definitions uh, and interpretations that are circulating. And this can be very confusing for newcomers to the topic, and actually very confusing to those uh, who've been studying gentrification for a while. Um, I want to say how I understand gentrification. Um, I understand it to be about the class transformation of space, or to use uh, a great definition by Jason Hackworth, the production of space for more affluent users. And the question of language is critically important. That word, gentrification, it makes us confront that question of class. Um, and therefore, the question of, well, in whose interests is urban transformation happening? There are many institutions, politicians, uh, media commentators, who want to avoid that question of social interest. And that's why you tend to see all kinds of terms that are used instead. Uh, certainly in Britain, this is the case. You see terms like regeneration, revitalization, renaissance, renewal. They all begin with R for some reason. Um, there are some excellent critiques out there of how, to take one example, regeneration. That makes gentrification seem natural or makes it seem positive. So if you think, uh, like if, if a forest burns down, it will regenerate naturally. If you abuse your liver, it will regenerate, or at least you hope it will. Um, there are also some stigmatizing implications of these terms, if you think about them. So to be regenerated, something or some place or maybe some people must have been degenerate. Uh, revitalization is even more problematic. Uh, 
It suggests that there is nothing vital about a place already, or that maybe the people living there are all devitalized individuals, or maybe even people not vital to a city. So language is really important. Now, gentrification commonly involves the direct displacement of low-income and working-class people from space, but not always directly. There are many different forms of displacement. Uh, a notorious critique is that, oh, well, if, if there's no direct displacement, then there's no gentrification, or it's something else. Another critique you tend to see is that gentrification is only uh, the narrow process of rehabilitating buildings, not about erecting new ones. And the word gentrification, uh, as we heard from Mona, uh, it, it did not exist until 1964 with Ruth Glass. But the process predates 1964. And I'd argue that if we choose not to apply the language of gentrification, then we haven't yet caught up with what Friedrich Engels uh, was saying over 140 years ago uh, in the housing question, when he talked about the class retake uh, and class conquest of space on a grand scale. And it seems to me that the scale of dislocation and the scale of pain that is happening in so many contexts today makes it imperative to fit the housing question, or perhaps more generally the, the urban question, uh, into a question of class struggle. In uh, 2013, I was uh, asked to contribute to a special issue of the journal Antipode, uh, which engages with the late, great Neil Smith's contributions to radical geography and well beyond that. And this will also be uh, reprinted uh, as a book, as an edited collection. And the invite that I received, it read, uh, it read as follows. Tom, we would like you uh, we would like to invite you to contribute an original essay that somehow contributes to amplifying, punctuating, or otherwise critically engaging Neil's ideas and politics. So I received this email, and it presented an enormous challenge, both personally and uh, professionally. Like he was to, to so many, Neil was uh, a dear friend, uh, a mentor, and an intellectual inspiration to me. So it was very hard uh, to engage deeply with his ideas without feeling a, a huge sense of loss. And on top of this, the body of scholarship on cities that uh, he left us is so immense and so rich that I thought, well, what could I possibly write about that would do justice to it? And I know that everybody else who received the invite to contribute to this issue uh, felt, felt, uh, felt the same way. So um, in the end, I decided to focus on his theory of gentrification, which is the rent gap. And I set out to read all Neil's work on gentrification again, and then everything ever written on the rent gap theory by others. And then I tried to uh, consider the rent gap theory with respect to what gentrification looks like today uh, in the context of the astonishing onward march and perhaps even rampant march of capitalist urbanization, and especially under conditions of financial crisis, which is having such an uneven geographical impact uh, in the world. The paper, uh, it took me 18 months uh, to write this, so I was lucky to have a very patient uh, special issue uh, editor. Uh, more on the rent gap in a minute, but I've got three, three main uh, reactions to the literature that I covered in that time. So first, um, in terms of the debates about the rent gap, I'll tell you about the rent gap in a minute, but the debates about it, and also the summaries of the theory that I, was, I kept finding in urban studies textbooks, I found these really frustrating. Um, Neil Smith's rent gap theory is an intensely political intervention. It insists that the social value of land must be put before its commercial value. But the debates and the summaries that I kept coming across time and time again, they typically strip the rent gap of its politics. And it was not long after, well, it was actually, it was the same time I was uh, doing the research for this paper that I came across this wonderful quote from Pierre Bourdieu. Um, theoretical jousting in the pages of academic journals, often with like charming erudite wit, is one thing. But the lives of the poor, 
and the working classes whose homes and communities and lives are gentrified is another matter entirely. And the rent gap theory was designed to explain and account for the urbanization of injustice. Uh, but most of the time, you just wouldn't know that reading the debates, and uh, especially some of the later debates, uh, and also some of the summaries of the theory. And so when I saw this quote from Bourdieu, it really kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of how I felt when I was uh, reading these debates. Secondly, the rent gap theory is tremendously helpful in challenging uh, a cottage industry of high-profile celebratory writing about gentrification that has emerged in certain Anglo-American circles in the 21st century. And I've got a few examples here for you. Uh, things kind of were kicked off by um, Andre Duaney, who many of you who are in the field of architecture, as I'm sure you are uh, in this room, uh, you may know who he is, the new urbanist uh, design guru, um, uh, Congress for the New Urbanism. I'm sure many of you know what that is. Uh, he wrote a piece uh, in a publication printed by a right-wing think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, in an April 2001. And it was called Three Cheers for Gentrification. And uh, this went viral uh, very quickly. And essentially what he argued in this piece was that gentrification is to be encouraged. We've all misunderstood it because it's the rising tide that lifts all boats. His words, not mine. Um, and then other things started appearing. Um, and I've just got, I, I could have brought hundreds of examples. I've brought a few with me. Uh, in about 2004, uh, there was some studies of displacement that were done in Boston by an economist called Jacob Vigder and in New York City by someone called Lance Freeman that used uh, evidence of low spatial mobility uh, among uh, low-income people to refute concerns about gentrification because the argument went that if people are not moving out of these neighborhoods, then this, 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 the displacement can't be happening on the scale that we've all thought it has. Um, these studies were flawed uh, in that basically the uh, evidence of mobility out of a neighborhood does not indicate that people are not being displaced. Because what often happens, as I found in uh, my own research on gentrification and displacement, is that sometimes when people are evicted, they, want, they do everything they can to stay where they are. And sometimes people double up in various apartments and... Um, the, these studies were also based on data sets uh, that were also uh, quite dubious. But what was more problematic was the way the media got hold of this and twisted uh, some of the, uh, the writing um, and also um, generally did not present the cautions and the caveats that appeared in the original studies. So the USA Today, a paper with a national circulation, gentrification a boost for everyone. Time magazine joined in a few years later. Um, this was in reaction to uh, three economists uh, who produced a national study saying more or less the same thing as those studies from Boston and New York, that displacement wasn't happening because of low mobility um, uh, of poor people out of um, gentrifying neighborhoods. Uh, and again, the cautions and the caveats in those studies were ignored, uh, and Time magazine produced this with a headline, Gentrification Not Ousting the Poor, I mean, if you want to know what the article's about, we'll basically remove the question mark, and that was what Time, Time magazine had, uh, had concluded. Um, BBC, the dear old BBC, bless them. Um, uh, <laughs> this, this one bothered me enormously. Um, in the UK, what's happening at the moment and has been happening for the last four or five years are government attacks on housing assistance for low-income people, which is all part of an attack on the welfare state. Um, this led the BBC to, uh, well, the, the debate was all about whether uh, people um, are, are able to uh, afford to remain in cities like London given that their housing assistance is being removed. But the BBC decided to run a feature with that headline, Do the Poor Have a Right to Live in Expensive Areas? And I remember spraying coffee everywhere when I looked at this first thing in the morning, and I immediately felt that. Um, you know, if we invert the question, then things get interesting. Uh, unfortunately, the BBC didn't. Um, and what was even more depressing is if you read some of the comments beneath this, uh, this article, um, which is never a good idea, by the way. But um, uh, another piece, uh, this is February 2014 in New York Magazine. Again, something with a very wide circulation. Uh, a piece uh, that was uh, printed and basically didn't really have any devastating insights on gentrification. Um, and 
basically the answer to the question, is gentrification all bad, was an emphatic no uh, from this journalist. And if any of you have seen this, you may know that uh, the film director, Spike Lee, uh, responded angrily, reflecting on uh, white families gentrifying uh, the Brooklyn neighborhood where he was raised. And uh, this got quite a lot of international uh, attention, so it went well beyond New York Magazine. Next, I'll stop in a minute. The Economist, uh, again, something you know that a lot of people read. Um, just what was it? When was this? What a few weeks ago? Bring on the hipsters! Gentrification is good for the poor. Um, and the argument in this one, um, with these uh, unfortunate images, uh, was that gentrification is wonderful because it helps break up concentrations of poverty. Uh, and actually, there were references to the things that have been going on in parts of the United States. Uh, like in places like Ferguson, saying, well, you know, you know what that place needs? A bit of gentrification. Uh, um, right, this is my last one. Okay, uh, this was when I really, um, I lost it here. Th th this is The Guardian, uh, which is a sort of left of center, well, traditionally left of center newspaper. Uh, their chief science writer, Philip Ball, read one article on gentrification published in a journal called Physics and Society. Uh, that concluded that um, gentrification was all just the natural way that cities change. There's, uh, we need to accept this and even embrace it as a sign of, of urban resilience. Uh, and the journalist uh, here agreed. And the headline appeared there, gentrification is a natural evolution. Now, by this time, I, I'd had enough. Uh, and so I hammered this out. Uh, there is nothing natural about gentrification. And I, um, I sent this off to The Guardian, and they didn't want to print it, uh, which was unfortunate. Uh, but New Left Project, which is actually a very interesting blog, um, d uh, took it, and um, they, uh, they printed it. So why am I mentioning all this? Well, the common denominator of all this writing is what I've called false choice urbanism. What do I mean by this? Well, the view that we are left with when you read these uh, pieces I've just shown you, is that it's either gentrification, which is good, or disinvestment, which is bad. That's the argument. That's the common denominator to all of these pieces. And what this does is that it reduces gentrification to a, like a sort of morality play that shuts out crucial political questions of how capitalist urbanization and uneven development create profit and class privilege for some while stripping many of the human need of shelter. So the rent gap theory is very helpful uh, in responding to false choice urbanism, for it shows how gentrification and disinvestment, it's not a choice, it's part of the same process. And therefore the former is not a remedy for the latter. And also this false choice urbanism, it reduces gentrification to a moral question as to whether it's good or bad. The rent gap theory redirects our focus to political questions. Urbanization for who? Against who? And who decides? And following from that, who decides who decides? Um, third, so the third reason I found the rent gap theory, um, um, or, or, or three reasons, uh, three reactions I had, and this is the third of the three to the rent gap, reading all this stuff. I started to think more critically about a new and fascinating and growing body of scholarship that has emerged under the banner of, of the new comparative urbanism informed by post-colonial theory. There's a piece by um, Ananya Roy in Regional Studies in 2009, a brilliant, brilliant essay that's become hugely influential already, particularly this, uh, this extract here. And this writing, what it does is that it poses necessary questions about the tension between the universal and the particular in critical urban theory. So when I read these words by Ananya Roy, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful read, brilliant writing, and it's hugely convincing at first glance. But then when I was reading the rent gap theory and reading more about gentrification, I began to develop a sort of yes and no uh, reaction to this. Um, so first of all, the yes. So a lack of attention to urban theories of and from the South, what's broadly known as the South, imposes a, a northern universality at the expense of potentially distinct processes behind 
southern urban uh, experiences that require grounded conceptualization. So following from what Roy is saying here, and I think she's right on this, is that we need to look at places, we need to study places, and think about them on their own terms, right? We shouldn't impose theories that are developed in Chicago, for example, to study what's going on in Beirut, right? And it's convincing, right? But then I had a, a negative to this. In the, I started to have a look at some of the work that's emerged in uh, post-colonial urban theory. And I was, although finding it interesting, I was quite disappointed in some of this literature. So there's all sorts of concepts that have emerged, like assemblages, uh, welding cities, ordinary cities, and there's a, a big body of work now. But what it does, at best, is that it sidelines and at worst, it ignores large-scale structures of capitalist state domination, especially questions of land rent, land ownership, land grabbing, and what I'll talk about later, the return of the rentier. You don't tend to find many people in writing in this sort of genre talking about the question of land. Uh, not all, you know, some people do, right? But generally, this was my reaction. Um, so quite simply, the more I got into the rent gap, the more urgent and relevant the theory re revealed itself to be. So I'm learning um, urban theories and concepts simply because of where they come from. This, this struck me to be uh, quite disingenuous under the sort of structural conditions um, that have been studied in, in pla from place to place. So I think we need to study and clarify these theories before just dismissing them and not learning them because of where they're from. At the same time I was thinking about these issues, um, I was asked by Policy Press uh, to read and comment on the final manuscript of this excellent new book that I thoroughly recommend to every person in this room who's interested in uh, other gentrification or gentrification beyond the core. Um, and this is just a, a short list of some of the studies uh, um, in this book. I, 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 ca I can't recommend enough the chapter on Beirut. It's superb um, yeah, in this book. Um, my, my reaction to, to reading the analyses of gentrification and displacement in contexts that are beyond the usual suspects, to use the language of the editors, um, was that the concepts that are formulated in the so-called global north are actually very useful indeed to every single chapter in the book, uh, seemingly against the expectations of the editors who put this project together. And the editors, uh, reflecting on the, the contributions in the book, they say this, we stand aside from other comparative urbanists in our belief that to flatten the globe and its multiple urban hierarchies so as to appreciate difference hides social injustices and neglects important power relations. So whilst context does matter, to unlearn how we currently think about gentrification would be deeply problematic given the injustices that are occurring uh, in this book and documented from Mexico City to Cape Town to Taipei City to Beirut to Shanghai. Um, and this was also confirmed uh, by two very talented and recently uh, graduated PhD students who worked with me, one on a study of pre-war Damascus and the other on Shanghai. And they both found the rent gap theory to be very helpful uh, to their analyses. Right, so that's the reactions to the literature that, you know, maybe, I, I'm, and I put them here to maybe provoke debate in the spirit of, uh, of the series as well. So the rent gap, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to outline the anatomy of this theory, show its distinctive features, to think about how it might be extended, um, and then I'm going to consider its relevance today. Um, and that's really the story of this paper that I produced for this uh, special issue. Probably the most astonishing thing about the rent gap theory is that it was based on field work carried out for an undergraduate dissertation. Now, <laughs> in Edinburgh, um, I'm always scaring my students because one of the things I have to do is supervise undergraduate dissertations. And uh, I have to give a, a lecture on how to put together a dissertation, you know, how to go about designing a research project and that kind of thing and coming up with research questions. And I always start with this slide and I say to my students, you know, think what you could achieve uh, with your undergraduate dissertation. And half of them, they, they, they throws them into panic. Some of them look as if they're going to leave the room. Uh, but a few are inspired. <laughs> um, so um, 
this was, uh, it's probably a, yeah, pro one of the only examples I can think of, of somebody actually changing the field of urban studies based on their undergraduate work. So Neil Smith was a student at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And in 1975, he spent his third year of uh, undergraduate studies on an exchange program uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and there in Philadelphia, he started researching the, the changes that had caught his attention in a central city district called Society Hill. And if you want to read this dissertation, um, I got hold of a copy, um, and I scanned it, and it's on my website. And if you like a good read, I can't recommend this enough. It's, it's truly remarkable that this was written by somebody age 21. Um, this dissertation, it was a response to the Chicago School ideas of spatial equilibrium and economic competition that neoclassical urban economists uh, had used to develop these models of urban land use and city morphology. Neil Smith was very suspicious of these uh, very influential models because of the consumer sovereignty paradigm undergirding them. What do I mean by that? Well, the paradigm was that the rational choices of individual consumers of land and housing in a market economy shaped the morphology of cities. That was the paradigm. And that had actually been hegemonic thought for a long time. So middle class and wealthy consumer demand for space apparently explained suburbanization in the United States. And this was seen by the scholars of the Chicago School to be the future not of just uh, Chicago, where most of these models were formulated, but the future of all American cities. And then, actually, many of these models have been seen to be the future of all urban places everywhere. This is where you can see why post-colonial theory is, is needed, right? But the empirical reality of central city gentrification called that paradigm into question. Neil Smith just could not accept that consumers were suddenly demanding, in lockstep, the opposite, to what had been predicted, and somehow choosing to gentrify central city areas uh, instead. So in his dissertation, in his field work, what he did was that he unearthed data showing that some middle class people in Philadelphia were not moving to the suburbs, and crucially, that only a trickle of middle class suburbanites had actually returned to the central city from the suburbs. What was happening instead was that disinvested space was being transformed for middle-class people via state-sponsored private sector development strategies that were affecting the central city of Philadelphia and particularly Society Hill. And what this was producing was handsome profits for developers and I guess the agents of capital at the expense of working-class people who were displaced from Society Hill. Now, after graduating from St. Andrews, Neil Smith moved to Baltimore to work with David Harvey for his doctoral studies. And his work became part of a much wider Marxist critique of the assumptions of neoclassical economic uh, theory, questioning in particular the assumption that competitive bidding for the use uh, of the land is like a, a fait accompli, a done deal. And one of the things Neil Smith learned from Marxist thought was the argument that the value of urban land is primarily a collective social creation. So if a piece of land located in a vibrant, growing city commands a, like a premium uh, on the market, we need to remember that collective social investments over time in the form of labor produced that vibrant and growing city. But then you have private property rights. And what they do is they allow landowners to capture most of that social investment uh, in the form of ground rent. And ground rent is quite simply the charge that landowners are legally entitled to demand for the right to use their land. The buildings placed on the land and the resources embedded within the land. And ground rent is usually received as like a, a stream of payments from tenants but also via any asset appreciation capture and resale. Understanding how ground rent fluctuates over time and across space 
requires attention to Neil Smith's wider theory of uneven development. His most famous book, most influential book, published in 1984, was called Uneven Development. Uh, he actually went to work with David Harvey on a PhD on gentrification, but it, the project became much, much bigger than that. Uneven development. What am I talking about here? Well, as suburbanization accelerates, in the, I'm, I'm talking here about the American city, more on this in a minute. As suburbanization accelerates, as capital moves to the suburbs, central city land developed in previous generations becomes disinvested as capital moves away, and therefore comparatively cheap, vis-a-vis -vis the central location that it occupies. So uneven development quite simply shows that capital is finite and cannot be everywhere. As a place gets developed, a place will be disinvested. As that disinvestment in the land intensifies, it actually creates lucrative profit opportunities for landowners, for developers, for investors, home buyers, and various levels of the state. And there is, of course, a particular geography behind this, right? So this was work that was based on studying the American metropolis. But from various empirical studies of uneven geographical development, we know that it always takes on particular spatial dynamics. And these are dependent on historical context, on institutional regimes, and political turmoil, just to take three things that, you know, that can shape how uneven development unfolds across a city. So as capital circulates in urban land markets from place to place, we start to see a, a disparity emerge, a divergence emerge uh, between capitalized ground rent I'm sorry, this hasn't come out very clearly. If you want to see this diagram, it's in the book Gentrification, 2008. Uh, this is the rent gap diagram. There's no way I can read all this to you. I wasn't going to anyway. But as capital circulates in urban land markets from place to place, we see a divergence between capitalized ground rent, which is here, and what capitalized ground rent is, is the actual rent captured with the present land use. And then it diverges from potential ground rent, which is that line. And potential ground rent uh, is uh, the maximum rent that could be appropriated based on what economists and planners like to call the highest and best use. And it's that gray shading, that disparity between capitalized and potential ground rent that Neil Smith called the rent gap. So that's the rent gap. Now, it's easy to get distracted here by some of the modeling that's taken place of rent gaps and by, you know, curves on a graph, okay? What's important, and I think for us to understand, is how the rent gap is closed. And he, here is Neil Smith on rent gaps and how they close. So gentrification occurs when the gap is wide enough that developers can purchase shells cheaply, can pay the builder's costs and profit for rehabilitation, pay interest on mortgage and construction loans, and then sell the end product for a sale price that leaves a satisfactory return to the developer. And then once that happens on, on a grand scale, the whole neighborhood has changed. Now, I've highlighted the word shells there. Why? Well, the flight of capital away from certain areas of the city has devastating implications for people who live at the bottom of the urban class structure. So the shells that Neil Smith refers to here do not simply appear naturally, as the Guardian would have you believe. They are actively produced by clearing out existing residents via all manner of tactics and legal instruments. Just to give some examples, landlord harassment, rent increases, redlining, arson, the withdrawal of public services, and more broadly, land grab. So closing the rent gap, it requires separating people currently obtaining use values from the present land use, providing those use values, in order to capitalize the land to the perceived highest and best use, to maximize its exchange value. So the rent gap, it highlights specific social interests where the quest for profit takes precedence over the quest for shelter, or the need for shelter, I should say. So the empirical study was an undergraduate dissertation, and the theoretical formulations came in a paper submitted when Neil Smith was a PhD student to the Journal of the American Planning Association. 
However, his PhD supervisor was unimpressed. Right? <laughs> so his, this is, Neil, we asked Neil Smith in 2010 to reflect on that paper, and here's what he said. I thought I was doing the usual journeyman graduate student work of taking on my betters. I was confirmed in this judgment when my advisor let the paper languish for months and months on his desk, water leaking on it from the unfixed ceiling, and especially when he finally delivered the assessment that nobody would ever publish it because my efforts at theory were much too simple and definitely obvious. I had already corrected the journal's proofs. So any PhD students in the room, if your advisor trashes your work, don't be, uh, don't be disheartened. Um, now, what does Harvey mean here? Let's look at this closely because it's instructive. Much too simple. So when he first read it, Harvey was deeply engaged in research for a pivotal chapter on rent, which appeared in his book, a Limit, uh, The Limits to Capital, which is, if you know, it's a thoroughly geographical dissection of Marx's writings. So he'd been, you know, really slaving away on this book, and his student produced a paper that did not even cite Marx, uh, nor engage with any of the debates on rent uh, in the literature. So he was unimpressed, much too simple. Definitely obvious. What David Harvey felt was that the rent gap was little more than a recasting of what he felt we already knew via the classic work of Homer Hoyt on residential filtering uh, in 1920s Chicago. So in 1928, Homer Hoyt had identified, and I quote, a valley in the land value curve between the central city and outer residential areas, indicating a location where the buildings are mostly 40 years old and where the, res the residents rank lowest in rent paying ability, end quote. And there's the land value valley. So the thing to think of here, though, is that Hoyt was, was not a critical analyst. So for Smith, this land value valley, radically analyzed, indicated a rent gap. So what Smith felt was that all of Hoyt's models and all of the models from the Chicago School f required a, like a dosage, like a high dosage injection of radical politics to make the class struggles and injustices behind them transparent. So for important analytical and political reasons, the rent gap was intentionally designed to be both simple and obvious. And as I thought more and more about this, I started thinking about the, the, role, of co the role of concepts in social theory. And conceptual simplicity is, is very different from simplistic conceptual thought. Concepts are our servants. We design them. They are there to be useful to help us to see things we didn't see before. If they're not useful, we shouldn't use them. But if you keep them simple, it's amazing the things that you can, the, you can find. Now, the, the, the rent gap theory has been subject to um, intense debate for over 30 years now. There have been many empirical tests of it, some so impressive that they led Neil Smith to sharpen and clarify his original theory. Um, I'm thinking here of the work of Eric Clark uh, in, in Malmo, in, in Sweden especially. There are, however, some people who think that we should get rid of the rent gap theory, abandon it totally because of the difficulties of collecting data. So the, I should say that the, these difficulties are real. So there are no readily available data, or variables, if you like, to measure capitalized and potential ground rent. So a researcher has to construct proxy indicators after sifting through decades of uh, things like urban land records, if they exist, uh, and becoming familiar with details of historical market conditions, neighborhood settings, tax assessment practices, state subsidies, so on, if that data is available. But then theories are always confronted with empirical difficulties. They should not be abandoned because of them. Um, I just want to add that the, the most common and actually the most ridiculous complaint about the rent gap, which I saw time and time again, is that it can't tell us anything about who the gentrifiers are, i.e. I, who the middle class people are. Well, yes, uh, it was never designed to. Um, and you see that criticism all the time, especially in urban studies textbooks. Well, it would never set out to, to look at that. It was interested in more who the people at the top of the class structure were, i.e. the agents of capital, interested in the role of the state, for example. It wasn't interested in the middle class gentrifiers. So it was never designed to do that. Now, the rent gap theory is, it's not watertight or without its limitations, and no theory is. Uh, 
but it can be developed along multiple fronts. And when I read everything, I felt that two stood out. The first is the question of displacement in any or all of its forms. Now, displacement was always implicit in the rent gap theory, but not explored specifically in any of Smith's writing. But his attempt to explain the historical decline of neighborhoods via the rent gap invites a closer consideration of displacement. As we know from the work of Peter Marcuse, who is still on his way to this conference having been delayed, he was sorry he couldn't make it uh, for the start. Um, displacement takes multiple forms. And a challenge for students of the rent gap theory is to develop and extend it to explain displacement in those forms, to illustrate specifically how the opening and closing of rent gaps leads to the agony of people losing their homes. A second area where it might be extended is the question of the impact of territorial stigmatization. There's an unresolved puzzle. Why is it that gentrification rarely seems to occur first in the most severely disinvested part of a city or a region where the potential for profit is the greatest? That's an unresolved puzzle in the literature but it proceeds instead in working class areas that are disinvested, but by no means the, the most disinvested. So that offer, that's a real challenge to the rent gap theory. And I think there's an answer if we think about stigma. And, and Dan Hamill, uh, a writer on the rent gap, has, has offered a clue here when he says that there are many sites that could return high levels of rent, but that development never occurs because of the perception of an impoverished neighborhood that prevents large amounts of capital being applied to the land. So we need to consider the rent gap in the context of stigma. And writers in the sort of political economic tradition of uh, urban studies, they often shortchange the symbolic. Um, so they miss how symbolic systems don't simply mirror social relations, but actually constitute them. So spatial taint can so often become like a rationale for fixing uh, an area of a city via its reincorporation into the real estate circuit of capital. Uh, of the city, but sometimes the perception is so negative and so entrenched that it can act as like a symbolic barrier to capital being uh, invested, or, this, or a barrier to the circulation of capital. So stigma has major implications for rent gap theory. Um, so stigmatization serves economic ends, but also vice versa. Um, as Bahar Sakizloglu has told me, uh, reminded me recently, there are examples under authoritarian urban regimes where the economics of interurban competition, which have gentrification strategies at their core, are serving brutal and punitive policies that are directed at working class minorities and particularly at the places where they live. So those are two areas where I felt that there could be much further work uh, on, on where the rent gap theory can guide our analyses. Okay, so moving on to the upscaling this in um, thinking of the, where rent, rent gaps are today and how the theory might help us interpret, I suppose, the nature of our historical moment. So to capture how gentrification had evolved into a, 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 a truly global urban strategy, to use his words, and to provide an illustration of the role of global financial systems and the deregulation of the entire global financial apparatus. Neil Smith would, he would often give the example of a 1995 construction of a luxury apartment building in the Lower East Side of New York City, which involved an Israeli developer, investment capital from a European American import bank, a Bangladeshi landlord, and a Long Island architect. But then he was guided by Henri Lefebvre's dialectical imagination in um, his famous book, The Urban Revolution. Particularly, Lefebvre's intriguing statement that urbanization had superseded industrialization as the major vehicle for capital accumulation. So, Neil Smith was guided by Lefebvre and he was acutely aware that sort of the global circulations of capital were producing extraordinary transformations of, and also struggles in, cities like Shanghai, Mumbai, Mexico City, on a scale that dwarfed anything ever seen in the theoretical heartlands of gentrification such as New York City, London. And that immediately raises the question of the production of these new urban geographies. And a strand of scholarship on this 
has recently uh, arrived at what Lefebvre called a problematique of planetary urbanization. And I'm thinking mostly here of the recent work of uh, people like Andy Merrifield and uh, Neil Brenner. Now, the remit of this uh, new body of work, to quote Neil Brenner, is to replace city and settlement-centric population-based models of urbanization with an exploration of the dynamics of implosion-explosion under capitalism. So that's the sort of overarching remit of this work that is very much guided by Lefebvre's writings. Now, Andy Merrifield has recently focused his attention on the reproduction and circulation of capital on a planetary scale and has characterized the sort of the grotesque waves of forced evictions and enclosures and dispossessions and sort of primitive forms of accumulation, if you like, that have been going on. He's characterized this as the new urban question, the title of his most recent book. And he calls this neo housemanization which is, of course, a reference to 19th century Paris. And I find this new work appealing because it collapses uh, some of the more unhelpful distinctions, I think, that are out there between the global south and the global north. Sometimes these distinctions, although they, uh, at their best they can be incredibly useful to help us understand urbanization, sometimes it degenerates into this sort of academic turf war, which actually sort of shields us from seeing things uh, um, that are happening. Um, so this new work, it collapses some of these unhelpful distinctions and it helps us move beyond squabbles in academic journals about who can say what about where. Um, and so the planetary circulation of capital in urban land markets across borders and all the upheaval that that causes does not recognize or even validate some of those rigid north-south distinctions. So it seemed prudent to consider the rent gap theory in that light. Um, because it's all about the circulation of capital. Too often, the rent gap, especially in these textbooks that bothered me, they, they, they get the rent gap gets labeled simply as the production side explanation of gentrification, which misses the process, which is all about circulation. This is from the original rent gap piece in 1979. If we redirect our theoretical focus toward the sphere of circulation, we can trace the power of finance capital over the urbanization process. So these words were written so since, since 1979. So since this year, we've witnessed quite simply the remarkable mobilization of state power in the extension of market rule that we tend to call neoliberalism. Unevenly, of course, but, but widespread. And the effect on the circulation of capital has been um, immense. Due to the shrinkage of manufacturing that almost <laughs> directly caused by neoliberalism, but also sort of a correlate of, of, of neoliberalism, the shrinkage of manufacturing, capital has switched from its primary circuit of industrial production to its secondary circuit, which is the one of urban land and real estate markets. And it runs parallel to that primary circuit. But in many capitalist economies, the secondary has supplanted the primary in terms of its overall importance often accounting for over 40% of all economic activity in a nation. Now, David Harvey's concept of fictitious capital is really crucial here. And this is the driving force of the secondary circuit of accumulation that I've just mentioned. So money that's doled out for a land title is equivalent to an interest-bearing investment, a claim upon anticipated future revenues, or, or a future gain, if you like. So by fictitious capital, what Harvey was referring to was the anticipation of future surplus value production from land titles. That's all that fictitious capital refers to. And in 1982, he wrote this, the freer interest-bearing capital is to roam the land looking for future ground rents to appropriate, and the more open the land market is, crucially, the more recklessly can surplus money capital build pyramid debt claims and seek to realize its excessive hopes through the pillaging and destruction of production on the land itself. Words from 1982. Now, what we have seen in the last decade or so, maybe even longer than that, as, as more land markets have opened up, is this process writ large. So the creation of fictitious capital through financial instruments designed to broaden the markets of who can bid and by how much means that expectations of what can be extracted 
from legally enforced, often rights to land, have drastically increased. So as a consequence, rent gaps have become much wider, uh, woven into causal linkages with processes that are happening at much wider scales. Now, Antonis uh, Vradis has recently characterized Greece as gentry nation. What does he mean by that? Well, basically, he, he characterizes the whole of Greece as one giant rent gap, one produced by external financial forces that have ransacked the country. Now, to address the crisis of continuous compound growth under long cycles of accumulation, capital has to devalue land, among other things, to, reinvest, to reinvent investment opportunities for the absorption of a surplus. At times of crisis, speculation in land that is being devalued becomes rife. And therefore, it's easy to see how speculative landed developer interests constitute what David Harvey has called, and I quote, a singular principal power that has yet to be accorded its proper place in our understanding of not only the historical geography of capitalism, but also the general evolution of capitalist class power. So speculation in land means that so more and more capital is being invested in search of rents and interest and future gains, rather than invested in any productive activity. Uh, a trend towards a rentier form of capitalism, a parasitic economy of unproductive extraction. There's a great new book that I came across recently, published last year by Andrew Sayer, who argues that we need to recover this lost vocabulary and the lost word of the rentier to, uh, to understand and to critique some of these uh, developments. And, I'm talk and what he is talking about is people who traverse the globe searching for the highest returns, who suck the living life out of the global economy to support nobody other than themselves, uh, to augment their own already massive power. Um, and this is justified often by ludicrous claims that their wealth is great for all of us, that it will trickle down and, oops, and we'll all benefit from it. Um, at, its most, at the most extreme form, right, what we are seeing is the thieving and robbery of value rather than the production of value. So asset pursuit and asset stripping via land grabbing and forced eviction. And this is well documented in context after context after context. And perhaps the most disturbing of all is the role of states. Um, government officials actively court rentier capitalists because they supposedly create wealth and produce economic growth. And often an entire propaganda machine exists to prevent the citizenry at large from understanding uh, the damage uh, that they do. And scholarship has uh, a role to play here, I think. I've been working uh, recently on the influence uh, of right-wing think tanks on government policies in Britain, which is an enormous influence. Uh, I don't know if they are think tanks exist uh, in Lebanon, but uh, in the UK they are <laughs> they're very, very influential in how policies get formulated. Um, and when I was thinking about uh, this influence, I was influenced in particular by a remarkable polemic by Martin Nikolaus that Neil Smith cited in his earliest writings on gentrification. And I put it here for you. And I'd argue that we really de we, we need to expose the practices of rentiers and their political and think tank friends as much as we can. Um, and a theory as simple as the rent gap is one step in the right direction, I think. Um, I think there's a need to study planetary rent gaps in relation to how rentiers, financiers, developers, states, how they work together to produce the conditions for accumulation in a very uneven, manner, a very uneven manner. So gentrification is, it's a dirty process often. It's important to make that dirt visible by analyzing destroyed lives, evictions, homelessness, loss of jobs, loss of community, loss of place, and so on. But I think we also need to study, as well as do that difficult work at the bottom, to do the difficult work at the top as well, and actually look at both sides, uh, the people who are most affected and the people who are, who are doing the gentrifying, if you like. To conclude then, so as I hope as I've made clear um, in outlining the rent gap, thinking about how it could be extended and then thinking about how it might help us understand where we are um, today. The rent gap is fundamentally about class struggle. It's about 
the structural violence visited upon people in contexts these days that are usually described as revitalizing, regenerating, experiencing a rebirth. Uh, they all begin with R, as I've said. Um, the class struggle in gentrification, however, is not between so-called hipsters, or bobos, or whatever they're called, and working class minorities, as you would believe if you read The Economist, for example. That's not what the class struggle in gentrification is about. The class struggle is between those who are at risk of displacement and the agents of capital who produce and exploit rent gaps. Now, housing um, is a struggle over the rights to social reproduction, um, the right to make a life. And this is a class struggle that's playing out within the realm of circulation largely between, on the one hand, those who live in housing precarity, um, on the one hand, and on the other, finance capital and all its many tentacles. So identifying rent gaps and identifying the institutions who are creating them with a view to capturing profits from them, it strikes me as vital to the formulation of strategies of resistance. Um, so questions that might stem from an analysis that, had, that would use the rent gap would be, well, who and where are the people who are stalking potential ground rent? Um, how are they going about it? What can be done to highlight the disturbing downsides of reinvestment uh, in the name of economic growth and job creation? So we need to perhaps reorient some of the writing to reinvestment for who? Reinvestment against who, maybe? Um, and how, if at all, are people fighting back? How are they trying to reinstate use values of land, streets, building homes, parks, centers that constitute an urban community? Uh, what can we learn from any of these movements? And this, of course, is so dependent on context, depending on, you know, it, the militarization of urban space uh, in some authoritarian regimes is so difficult, it's difficult to know where, to, where, the, where resistance can form. Um, and also, the people most affected by gentrification uh, are usually people uh, in economic precarity who need to work. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all very well to say, you know, people should be out on the streets and things. Well, th there's often a reason why people are not. Um, every year, I take my students to the spot in Edinburgh where Neil Smith uh, first spotted gentrification in 1972. Um, it was a pub that distinguished itself from others on the same street by serving salad. Um, <laughs> and he said this is, you know, this is, in Scotland it was extraordinary to see a pub serving salad. I should say it still is. Uh, um, so I take my students to this spot here um, and I read them extracts from his work. The great uh, social theorist Donna Haraway uh, offered these words not long after Neil passed away. Um, when I work through Neil's ideas with my students, and when we go here, um, we end up feeling the same. I'll stop there. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Thanks.